Hello, my name is Brad Allenby, and I'm the Lincoln Professor of Engineering and Ethics and President's Professor of Engineering in the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment. What I'm going to talk to you about today is a concept called weaponized narrative. Since that's probably new for you, let's begin with a definition. What is weaponized narrative? Weaponized narrative is the use of disinformation, fake news, social media, and other information and communication technologies to create stories that are intended to subvert and undermine an adversary's institutions, identity, civilization, and will by creating and exacerbating complexity, confusion, and political and social schisms. Now, if you think about it, this definition comes fairly clearly out of a couple of recent events. In particular, there's three of them that you should bear in mind as we go through this brief discussion. One is the successful invasion by Russia of Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, which relied heavily on weaponized narrative. The second is the Brexit campaign, which has significantly impacted the European Union, uh, conducted primarily by uh, Russia, its agents, and so-called useful idiots, that is, people who advance Russian interests uh, without explicitly being a Russian agent or paid by Russia. And, of course, the American election. Uh, as I speak, uh, the results of uh, the FBI investigation into that are just beginning to be felt, uh, so we'll see where that goes. But it is clear that Russia has, not just for months, but for years, been engaged in trying to use weaponized narrative against what they perceive to be their primary adversary, that is, the United States. The study of weaponized narrative began with the release of a report uh, early in uh, 2017 uh, at Washington, D.C. conference uh, held by the Center uh, uh, for the Future of War, where uh, Joel Garreau, myself, and other colleagues discussed weaponized narrative in the broader context of continuing adversarial relationships between large states and increasingly non-state actors. So where does weaponized narrative come from? In particular, how is it different than, for example, disinformation campaigns that the CIA, Russia, and others used during the Cold War? Weaponized narrative is different for a couple of reasons. The first is it draws on significant advances in uh, fields such as behavioral economics, evolutionary psychology, neuroscience, uh, and marketing, combined with an increase in complexity that arises from a very dramatic and significant uh, change in information volume, velocity, and variety. Most people don't understand how significant that change is. But for example, uh, experts have pointed out that the amount of data that we produce and communicate in two years uh, in our modern society uh, is as much or more than all of the data previously generated in all of human history. That substantial increase loaded onto institutions and human psychologies that were never designed to handle that amount of information uh, has significant implications. And we'll talk about some of them as we go through this. Uh, the point to understand is that that is a significant change that means that even though some of the techniques look the same as in the past, disinformation and weaponized narrative today is far more powerful than anything that we've had to deal with. Uh, we are also becoming much more adept at using uh, procedures, activities, and tools that are based on some of the findings of behavioral economics, particularly heuristics that human cognition is prone to. So for example, uh, we all know these days about the confirmation bias. If I give you a piece of information which fits into your belief system, you are quite likely to believe it and to accept it as true. If I give you a piece of information, regardless of how true it is, 
that does not fit into your belief system, you're quite likely to reject it. And this is true of people on the political right, on the political left, it's true of smart people, it's true of people who aren't that educated. Uh, it's a human characteristic, and the reason is that our cognition is operating at the edges of its competence, and so to the extent that it can use these kinds of shortcuts, it will, and we all are prone to that. The more I understand those shortcuts, the more I'm able to manipulate you, and that's a lot of what weaponized narrative is intended to do. Uh, are there examples? Sure. Uh, but what's important is it's not just examples, for example, the successful Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it's also the fact that the doctrines and strategies that are being used by our adversaries uh, is different. And because of that, we have weaponized narrative becoming a part of the defense strategies particularly of Russia, but also to some extent of China, and non-state actors such as some of the uh, fundamentalist uh, uh, jihadist groups in the Middle East. This poses us overall with a very interesting challenge which has, obviously, a lot of operational implications, but also a lot of ethical implications, and we'll get into some of those. So what is the challenge? Well, the challenge is that, in fact, Russia, at this point, regards itself as being in a state of war with the United States. So does China. When I say that, you shouldn't take it to mean that they're planning on a physical invasion of the United States. In fact, their strategy has evolved to a point where a physical invasion of the United States would be considered a failure mode. That is to say, Russia and Chinese strategies are now built around the idea that a direct military confrontation with the United States is not a wise move, in part because America has overwhelming conventional military dominance. So you obviously don't attack uh, an adversary at their strongest point. And for the United States, uh, our military, our conventional military, is our strongest point. What that means, though, is if you're going to protect your interests as Russia or China, you have to do so through uh, so-called asymmetric warfare. That is, you find weapons and weaknesses that you can exploit that are not part of your adversary's strength. In this case, what it means, for example, is that the fragmentation that characterizes a democracy such as the United States can be used effectively by an adversary to weaken the United States without any military confrontation at all. When I say Russia is at war with the United States, what I mean is that's exactly what they're doing, and they regard that as their modern form of warfare, and a very effective one it is proven to be. As I say, China is not in the headlines as much as Russia, in part because what they've done is more subtle, and in part because they haven't chosen to be as flagrant about it uh, as Russia has. What are some of the tools of the trade? Well, this is hard to say unless you're working in a confidential environment, in a classified environment. And the reason is that the cutting edge of a lot of these kinds of activities is, um, is heavily hidden in the classified section uh, of government portfolios. And so we're not liable to, to see it. Where we can see it, what is interesting is that it has almost always been more sophisticated and more advanced than what we thought was possible. So for example, the Stuxnet attack, which was probably done by the United States and Israel, targeting Iranian centrifuges through a uh, information weapon that was specifically designed to uh, act only on one technology system, that is the Iranian centrifuge system, and was effective, that kind of targeted cyber weapon, most experts would have told you before it happened, it was at least a decade away. Of course it wasn't. Uh, Cambridge Analytica, which uh, was involved in both the Brexit and the U.S. election campaigns. Uh, in Brexit, they were uh, supporting Brexit, and in the uh, U.S. election campaigns, they were supporting uh, Senator Cruz and then, of course, um, President Trump. 
their approach is to mine big data and use analytics to identify voters whose behavior can be nudged, not completely changed, but nudged by use of the right narrative so that they will enhance the opportunities for the party that hired them. In the case of Brexit, what they did was target people who were likely to believe, for example, anti-immigration narratives. In the case of the American election, they targeted, for example, Afro-Americans who were likely to be dissuaded from voting um, by seeing pictures, uh, older pictures of um, Hillary Clinton talking about super predators. The point of all of this was to identify down to the individual level enough psychological information so that you could develop a targeted narrative that would change their behavior without them knowing that you'd done it. And they were effective. How effective is a matter of significant debate. What is not debatable is that in future, those kinds of weapons are going to be much more effective um, and much more powerful, which raises some obvious ethical and governance issues. If the assumption behind democracy is that you have informed citizens, and if I now have enough scientific uh, and psychological information to change people's behavior patterns without their knowing it so that they think they're being informed when in fact they're voting the way I want them to, uh, is democracy still viable? What defenses can a democracy mount against that sort of attack? These are open questions, by the way. This is all very new. Uh, we don't have good answers to that. What are some of the tools that are used? Well, trolls and bot armies. Uh, we know that the uh, Russians have troll factories in St. Petersburg, uh, which operate by increasing the uh, anger, hatred, and divisiveness in American society. So for example, uh, if you looked at articles about uh, President Obama or articles about Black Lives Matter, uh, you often would find very uh, racially charged comments in the comment streams. Many of these came from Russian troll factories. Their goal was not to support or to attack uh, President Obama or Black Lives Matter. Their goal was to increase the level of anger, frustration, um, and hatred in American society. So it didn't really matter what side they were on. What mattered was that they increased the emotional divisions in American society. And this they did, uh, they did and do very effectively. Bot armies, which are armies of software uh, devices that will reinforce messaging, are also important. It's a well-known human trait that if you come up with an idea and everybody around you thinks it's stupid, you're quite likely to give up the idea. If you come up with an idea and everybody around you thinks it's wonderful, you're quite likely to run with it. So if I have bot armies that can constantly reinforce your ideas or your narratives or what you think are facts, you're much more likely to believe it. This is why, for example, stories like um, uh, uh, Mrs. Clinton as a candidate had a pizza uh, um, store in Washington, D.C., where in the basement uh, she was running a pedophile ring. People believed that to the point where, of course, somebody came up with a gun and shot up the pizza store. Why did they believe it? Well, in part, they believed it because these bot armies would flow out and support what they heard. So they thought that what they were hearing was accepted by the broader society, by their broader community. Uh, weaponized narrative is the development of narratives that get people to change their position without them knowing that they change their position. Uh, you see these, if you look carefully, constantly at play in the United States right now. And the reason is that uh, most, uh, most people who are interested in uh, opinions in your political behavior have learned that manipulating you through fear and anger is a very powerful way to get you to respond. Uh, and so we develop these weaponized narratives. Uh, the Russians, uh, of course, are using weaponized narrative more broadly against the United States uh, and very effectively. Part of the goal of this kind of campaign is to destroy trust in leaders, in media, and in institutions. This is part of the Russian playbook. And you see this not just in, for example, Ukraine, 
But Russia has been conducting a low-level disinformation campaign, weaponized media campaign against uh, the Balt uh, states, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. If you look at the techniques there, they involve attacking the media. And the reason you do that is so people don't have any trusted source of information broadly accepted, which means they fall back on their social media platforms, and then you can manipulate the social media platforms. You attack the institutions. So for example, there have been a lot of political attacks on American security institutions. Part of the reason is that if there are efforts to try to diffuse any possible findings those institutions may make, one of the ways you can do that is by attacking the institutions so they have no credibility, at least with your target audience. And of course, you want to make sure that, that people don't uh, flock to a leader, uh, but flock to you. And again, the way you do that is through disinformation campaigns. Uh, another example of how you do this is in flipping Twitter accounts. Uh, it turns out, this came out of a couple of months ago now, again, this, I'm doing this in 2017. It turns out that the Russians had flipped a number of military Twitter accounts. They hadn't done anything with them, but their intent was when the situation was ripe to flood the Twitter sphere with their message, which because it was coming from official American military sources would be perceived as true, which would allow them to significantly uh, reduce American responsiveness to uh, geopolitical challenges um, and just cause chaos in the United States, which benefits uh, the Russians. Sock puppet websites are websites that are set up that by and large provide good news or at least reasonable news until you want them to begin providing disinformation and then they go into disinformation mode. So if you have enough of these, the effect is to make disinformation appear to be the uh, real information and it floods the market. And by the time that truth begins to come out, it's already too late because people have accepted the disinformation version. Some of, the, some of the things that we know that Russia is doing. Uh, on most of these, um, I would caution you that the direct evidence uh, is not available and may never be available in part because uh, the way that these things are financed is often extremely difficult to trace. And if you do trace it, the way you trace it may be part of your uh, national security establishment so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't come out. One of the things you want to do is you want to subvert NGOs, political parties, and others who can support your agenda even if they think that they're supporting their own agenda. So for example, we know that uh, a number of environmental groups in Europe who are very strongly anti-fracking are indirectly being supported by the Putin government because the strongest lever he has over Europeans is his control of their energy flows. If they frack, they begin to develop their own indigenous energy flows, and that becomes a threat to Kremlin dominance over uh, Western Europe. So what do you do? Well, you do the smart thing. You fund NGOs who use environmental arguments, which may be valid, by the way. That's an important complexity in this whole situation. You use uh, environmental NGOs to ensure that fracking doesn't occur, which ensures that you're able to maintain your control of the European polity. Uh, similarly, you'll notice that although fracking is the single most important geopolitical control the United States has over Russia, in the United States, all discussion of fracking is only done in the environmental realm. This is significant because it means that the real value of fracking is consistently understated and misunderstood by the public, which becomes a very effective way to manage anti-fracking campaigns uh, in the United States. Uh, Snowden is an interesting example. Uh, what, what Mr. Snowden had in mind, goodness only knows, um, and I wouldn't purport to, to know that, nor would uh, most of the people I know. What is clear, though, is that the information that the Russians got from him was a very important part of the success of the uh, invasion of Eastern Ukraine. Because what it did was it allowed a constant series of leaks, not unlike the leaks during the American presidential campaign, 
which undermined the NATO front against Russia and made a weaker response politically necessary. By convincing the German public that the Americans were spying on them in illicit ways, uh, the Russians were able to ensure that the German government could not take a strong stand with the Americans against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you'll notice if you go back and look at the, and look at the uh, uh, contemporary discussions that the German public was very upset that the Americans uh, were bugging their leader, um, uh, Ms. Merkel. On the other hand, the German leaders were not at all surprised. And the reason, of course, is that in the, in the espionage game, everybody bugs everybody else. The Israelis spy on the Americans, the Americans spy on the Germans, the Germans spy on the Americans. That's all accepted. So it wasn't that big a deal for the leadership. But the public was shocked. And because the public was shocked, it allowed Putin to manipulate German public opinion to reduce the effectiveness of the NATO response. So regardless of what Mr. Snowden's intentions were, in fact, his information was extremely useful to Mr. Putin, who used it brilliantly. Uh, the Ukrainian campaign uh, in the long run may not have been a great idea for Russia, but in the short run, it was clearly a tactical and strategic, uh, um, very significant and very well done uh, campaign. Another thing that the Russian playbook calls for is what's called reflexive control. And what this refers to is not to try to deliberately change a person's view. So if I argue with you about something, for example, you say, well, you're trying to change my view and you can argue back with me and we discuss various issues. Um, but that's hard. And if you're a committed, for example, Democrat and I'm a committed Republican, particularly in this country right now, I will, be, I will find it very, very hard to change your mind. However, if I can work underneath your defenses, underneath your narrative immunity system, and I can get you to believe things that you then build into your narrative, I don't have to convince you explicitly of anything. Your behavior will follow what I want it to be. So in Charlottesville, if you recall the incident with the, the neo-Nazis uh, and the alt-right, where they were, began chanting, among other things, Russia is our friend. Where did that come from? I mean, these are, these are, by their own statement, highly patriotic Americans. Russia is our friend. Well, it came from the fact that Russia has been very carefully for a number of years um, working with alt-right movements in Europe and the United States, uh, sometimes explicitly, most of the time implicitly, to convince them that their agenda aligns with the Russian agenda so that when they now behave in the way they think reflects their free will, it in fact supports the Russian agenda. This is reflexive control and it's very powerful because it's very expensive for me to force an opinion on you. And in fact, if Russia tried to enforce an opinion on the alt-right explicitly, they would fail miserably. But if I can convince you to behave in a certain way, then I have true control. And it's cheap and it's effective. And most importantly, it's very, very hard to trace and very, very hard to counter. Because if I try to counter it explicitly, let's say I'm the CIA or the FBI, if I try to counter it explicitly, you've been trained to think that I'm in fact using false news to try to undermine your belief system uh, and that makes it extremely difficult. So it's a very effective tool. Weaponized narrative is an important part of this. Now, what are some of the ethical implications of this structure, this system, which I'll emphasize is not science fiction, is already in place? Well, first, good weaponized narrative comes out of a completely amoral postmodernist ethic. That is to say, for example, if I'm talking about race relations in the United States, I don't care if blacks are right or if whites are right. All I want to do is create more anger, more tension, more fear. And that's what weaponized narrative does. So query whether the United States, which holds itself to a higher ethical standard, could in fact even play well in that kind of environment. 
Are we, by our own ethical system, inhibited from being able to respond to the kind of asymmetric warfare that is being deployed against us? That may well be the case. Other ethical implications. The U.S. is very clear that there is a deep divide between private and government, private and public, and a deep divide between military and civilian. That's built into the Constitution. Those divides are much more flexible in other countries. The PLA, for example, runs a lot of the commercial cyber attacks that, that uh, China conducts. Are we, because of our structure, less capable of responding to these challenges? In other words, has Russia, has China, have others identified an asymmetric form of warfare that the United States, by its very nature, is ethically incompetent at? Uh, I don't know the answer, uh, but I pose it to you as an extraordinarily challenging uh, issue in applied ethics. Most people navigate ethical challenges by reference to frameworks that arise from their experience, from their society, from the narrative of their culture. Once I learn how to do weaponized narrative, I am learning how to manipulate that framework. If ethics arrive from that framework, and that framework becomes a design space, at least partially, for adversaries and others who may not share our values, what are the implications for ethics? Can we even think about ethics, or are we limited to responding to situations as well as we can based on some kind of ethical gut feeling? Uh, it's an important question. And let me, let me suggest how difficult this may be. Uh, right now, a lot of people in the United States, again, this is 2017, a lot of people in the United States are concerned because Russia obviously purchased some very powerful but uh, problematic advertisements uh, on YouTube, Facebook, uh, and other social media. For reference, 65% of Americans get all of their news from social media. So this is not a, uh, not a weak uh, accomplishment on the part of the Russians. It does not, however, appear that they did anything wrong in a legal sense. They were legal entities. Uh, they were able to buy these. They bought these. Uh, and this is free speech. In an era of weaponized narrative, is the First Amendment obsolete? That is a huge ethical question. It's one that people are beginning to wrestle with, but most people don't even realize that it's in play. And the danger, of course, is that it will be resolved one way or the other before anybody realizes that it was actually an issue. And going back deeply, the foundation for what we think of as truth coming out of the Enlightenment is generally the scientific method and science. If you look at society more broadly, you notice that a lot of this is failing. Um, Anti-evolution, uh, anti-GMOs, uh, anti-vaxxers. People are more and more taking those pieces of science they like and rejecting those pieces of science they don't like. In other words, what we're seeing in science is the same fragmentation and rise of narrative as superior to science that we're seeing in weaponized narrative. If that is the case, and if narrative becomes the defining element of truth for most Americans, and remembering it's a democracy, so most Americans control the vote, control the government, uh, does this mean that truth has been rendered relative in a way that is far more profound than any of us realized when we started talking casually about truth being relative. We don't know the answer to those questions. What weaponized narrative does in a very effective way is it puts the onus on us to try to understand our world far more deeply and more with more sophistication than we do because the ethical responses so far have been superficial and even dysfunctional. If we are going to do that, then we are faced with a truly powerful ethical challenge, which is if you're going to birth the successor to the original enlightenment, if you are going to operate in a world where narrative and not this fact or that fact 
become truth, uh, how do you do that? Thank you.